uh, it's a great pleasure and honor uh, to invite and have with us uh, Dr. Mete M. Berger for today's uh, webinar on our critical care webinars by Young Indian Intensivist. So Professor Mete M. Berger is from Switzerland as a renowned nutrition expert and much of what we practice today comes from her work over the last few decades. I will just introduce her to you and then we can have her presenting the topic and that is nutrition in the ICU. So Dr. Mete M. Berger is a professor honorary at Lausanne University, Switzerland, Faculty of Biology and Medicine. She's an intensivist, burns and clinical nutrition specialist at CHUV, which is the hospital associated with Lausanne University. As far as her research work is concerned, she has more than 260 peer-reviewed publications and 40 book chapters on clinical nutrition and burns management. She is an associate professor in intensive care medicine with greater than 30 years of experience. Honorary member of the ISCM, ESICM, member of the ICU Nutrition and Micronutrient Guidelines Groups, member of the ICU Nutrition and Micronutrient Guidelines Group, that is primarily ESPN, the European Society of Clinical Nutrition and Metabolism, which frames the guidelines for management in, in nutrition in the ICU. She is a international speaker having spoken in various countries across the globe, associate editor at Clinical Nutrition, and her area of expertise is clinical nutrition, micronutrition, trace elements, and antioxidants, monitoring of nutritional interventions, and major burn treatment. Good evening, dear Indian colleagues. I'm Mette Berger. I'm an intensive care physician, now retired, well, recently, and continuing to do research. And it's a honor that you invited me to talk about nutrition of the critically ill. Of course, I have some conflicts of interest, but they are mainly the fact that I'm a member of guideline groups, of European guideline groups, and I will uh, present to you the position of the European societies. Well, the plan of the meeting now is to show you, well, a few special things here. We will go through evaluation and screening, feeding plans, substrates and monitoring, which are the essential steps of a nutrition prescription and evaluation. Well, when you are facing a patient, uh, if you have a young male or you have an old lady, you can obviously see on these CT scans of the thigh that the body composition is different. And the muscle is reserved for both immunity and actually nitrogen. So you obviously can see that with aging, there is a difference and we will have to consider that. Why am I talking about muscle? Well, because we know since this uh, emblematic paper by Zudin Puducherry's group 10 years ago, that if you follow up critically ill patients over time, very rapidly, you within 10 days, you will have lost about 20% of muscle mass. And the loss is greater, the more organ failures you have. And that will impact the energy requirements. And the patient who comes in is different also. Um, their anterior history is actually decided by the disease partly, but not only. A trauma patient or a burn patient comes in straight from a normal life to the ICU, while 
most patients actually have been sick and have been eating, like we could see from nutrition day data, as usual, only rarely. Most patients have not eaten enough, which puts them at risk of, well, complications, including the refeeding syndrome risk. And then, well, previously, the guidelines before the 2019 we wrote had never really detailed this aspect. It's that the patient is not the same through disease. You know, as a clinician, that the acute phase is one thing, the recovery is another, yes, but that translates into metabolic changes with intense catabolism during the first days and hopefully reverting to anabolism thereafter. Of course, this is influenced by what I just told you, the status before admission, which you need to integrate, and your aim is functional recovery. Well, how can we then evaluate and screen? Well, this history we need to consider. And this is something which is integrated in the very simple NRS risk that Condorp and colleagues made in 2002 and published 2003. And it's very simple. You can do it in less than a minute, which is the advantage of it. And it integrates some very simple, actually nutritional markers, which is BMI, low, normal or high, eating the last days before you were admitted and weight loss. That is a sign of catabolism. And then severity of disease and age. Is it 70 years? Depends on the worst of the planet, but high age is a problem. And the worst of the first A, plus B plus C gives you then a score, which if it is low or high, tells you something about the coming mortality. This data comes from my ICU. Marina collected the data of, well, actually 150 critically ill patients who were persistent critically ill. And we were searching for something that would enable detecting those who would do poorly. <laughs> Having hundreds of variables, we ended up finding that the very early in available within 24 hours, NRS was actually predictive of mortality. Of note, all our patients were not very well fed because these complex patients who stay more than 10 days, they have so many problems that it's, it's a challenge to feed them. So we were not always optimal, but you see here, it is a 22% difference in mortality. And we knew from before that what you do to the patient will potentially give an additional disease. It is acute iatrogenic underfeeding. And while not full feeding early on is perfectly what we want, as soon as the energy deficit increases, this starts having a well impact, severe impact on the patient's outcome. When you reach eight minus eight thousand kilocalories or hundred kilocalories per kilo body weight, you have an increase in complication which can be attributed to acute denutrition. And when you reach minus ten thousand, hundred and thirty actually per kilo body weight all have something. It doesn't show in the discharge report. It appears as ventilator-associated pneumonia or as surgical suture leakage or wound healing problems. Doctors usually are not happy to write that they just forgot to nourish the patient. And I'm insisting on the fact that some deficit is absolutely fine. How were these studies done? Actually, we did them in parallel, Israel with Pia Singer's team and my own team, we had indirect calorimetry, we had the same computerized information system, so the data are very complete. And the problem is that we now are very much aware that full early feeding is not the correct strategy. It is progressive feeding. Well, what does our ESPEN recommendation say? It has been republished 2023 as a practical version, but it is the same content. 
And it says that in case of contraindication to oral or to enteral, you might be using parental and that you might use it instead of it in quite early on, potentially, if you have a severely malnourished patient. Well, look here. This is data from the United States. It is a prospective study in 230 surgical ICU patients. And they classified the patients according to the fact that they had had minus 6,000 or over 6,000 kilocalories per kilo body weight of deficit. And you remember this ramping up I showed you where 8,000 starts becoming a problem. Here we're just below. And indeed, if you feed your patients correctly, there are three times more likely to go home to be discharged home, which is what we look for. Mortality is different also, be it in hospital or 30 days. How much? Well, how to cover energy is the question. Yes, we recommend indirect calorimetry whenever possible, but it's not available all over. And if we have indirect calorimetry, we go isocaloric after day four, but we go to the target progressively. Hypocaloric is the correct strategy if you go by equations. We recommend going low during the first week at least. But to deliver something, huh? not, going low does not mean zero. Huh? Going low does mean start, if it's central, by 10 milliliters an hour during the first day, huh? not more. And after day three, we can increase to 80, 100% of even measured energy expenditure. You see, we never exceed 100%. There are good reasons for that. Let's go for indirect calorimetry. Uh, what is indirect calorimetry? Well, it is using the VAIR equation, which is now 60 years old, but it's very simple. It's physiology. Energy comes from oxygen you inhale, and CO2 is the waste. So from that, based on the energy equivalence of CO2 and VO2, you can find that you have the energy expenditure. This is still not the need, but it's the energy expenditure. Nitrogen is part of the original equation, but it's such small amounts and knowing the difficulty of getting proper urine collections and getting nitrogen analyzed, we skip because it's a value between 20 and 40 kilocalories per day. So skip it and stay with VO2, VCO2. Why? Well, when you compare to indirect calorimetry, and this paper comes again from Pierre Singer's team, and you do a Bland and Altman test, which compares whatever of these equations, Fizzy, Ayrton Jones, Penn State, etc., you can observe that none of them is exact. They give uh, values which are reasonable in about 25 to 30% of the time, but you don't know which is correct without measuring. And this is very important also to consider energy requirements change over time. These are COVID patients in Paul Wischmeyer's ICU, and they start with 23, 22 kilocalories, but after one week increase progressively, and they end up 28. None of the equations is giving you the right answer at any time. Well, if you put it a more detailed way, this there and there are the different equations. The only one which works is in Drake calorimetry. Harris Benedict, of course, which is the banal energy expenditure, is not giving you the answer. And any of the factors you apply to Harris Benedict is not validated. Then comes this paper, again from Pierre Singer's team. And what does it show? that there is a sort of optimal point relating the delivered energy compared to uh, mortality. 
Well, 100% is to give what you have measured. If you have 70 to 80 is top for proteins, actually 100% is 1.3 gram. Um, does it mean that you should target 70%? Well, actually, no. It means you should target 100, but Pierre Singer's team, my team, Claude Pichard's team, we have always been practicing this ramping up of delivery, never full feeding early on. So now, if you take, as in his study, um, the patients were staying median five days. If you ramp up, you make an arithmetic mean, you end up with 74%. If your patient stays 12 days, you make an arithmetic mean of these different values, you have 88%. Did we target 70%? No, suddenly. But we progressed over time. And the guidelines, what do we say? Well, the SICM guidelines we wrote in 2017, and the ESPANs that we wrote uh, 2019, and we are now about to redo the studies, focus on different aspects. Uh, ESICM focused on gastrointestinal function and early enteral nutrition, which said that one should start early, 10 to 20 milliliter, depending on the patient's size, with careful monitoring, and to increase progressively only if there was no symptoms of intolerance, and not aiming at covering the full energy target. While we in ESPEN insisted on avoiding overfeeding, because all the equations actually favor overfeeding much more. And we now have become aware about why this is so important, actually. If this is study coming from my ICU, Luc Tapia, our physiologist, was actually doing tracer studies on our patients, which in this case were young trauma patients, 40 years old, and when we did that study, end of the 90s, uh, we were real bad at enteral feeding. Our nurses had no strategy, we neither. And in these patients who were starved, we measured 1800 calories per day as resting metabolic rate, because in this case it is resting, they had received nothing. They were modestly hypermetabolic, and glucose turnover showed that they were producing 3.1 milligram kilo minute, which translates to 310 grams when you consider the weight of these patients. 1,200 calories. 1,200 compared to 18, the patients are covering by day three, two thirds of their energy requirements endogenously, no feeding. Of course, this had a price, which was the loss of muscle, 120 grams per day. And if you put these data of our starved trauma patients along with our patients 65 years old, where we did this partially fed and fed some years later, when you know that actually we have almost, the, there are no data for the first 48 hours, um, we can see that, well, this starts becoming something important. We are producing between 110 by day 10 and 300 grams by. So this is why we recommend the strategy of considering total energy expenditure, which we measure, considering the endogenous energy prediction, if we full feed early on, you overfeed, which we know is bad. And if this occurs in the early phase of the cataclysm of acute disease, you harm your patients with feeding. So you should never do that, but you should go progressively. And this is why knowing about this progression, Knowing that most equations fail, we now have actually three meta-analyses showing that if you use for your targets indirect calorimetry, you reduce mortality. Why that? Well, these data come from the Bern world. They come from Galveston. And in Burns, we have for a very long period of time actually been uh, encouraged to feed high. When I started with Burns in the 80s, the rule was measure and give 1.5 times the measured value. We know this is wrong. Now we give what we measure, not even that. So what does this study tell? One is I give what I have measured. 
Two is I give the double of what I measured. Oh, fantastic. This looks as if you were gaining body weight. Uh -uh. No, look here. If you look at the muscle mass, and if you look at the fat mass, there is only one which increases. It's fat. It's fat. And this occurs as soon as you exceed 110% of measured energy expenditure. The frame is very tight. The pa patients do not tolerate overfeeding. What does it give? This. This is typical autopsy findings in burned children who have been overfed. Fatty liver. Okay, which route should you go? Well, enteral, we always recommend because it has non-nutritional benefits, production of internal, well, many. And then we have, because this enteral does not always work, alternatives. It has to do with history, actually. Um, parental nutrition started in, actually, the four, well, late 60s, uh, with cottonseed emulsions in United States, which gave poor results and uh, actually ended with the FDA forbidding uh, use of lipid emulsions. We were lucky in Europe in 61, Arvid Retlin was able to synthesize the soybean emulsion we have today, which is solubilized with egg yolk. And then came the crystalline amino acids. So there has been a progress here. And Peter First and Steele invented the dipeptide because it had disappeared. Then we got in Europe already the MCT LCT emulsions. Then we got the different oils, the structured lipids, and now we have the combination of all. And this is very important because many of the data from the 70s are due about PN of in the United States of clinicians not having lipid emulsions available and having to deliver very high amounts of sugar to compensate for the energy, which is wrong. We are lucky. And in Europe, we have been able to test very well on both. So which route continuous rather than bolus central should be used for the moment. The data have not changed yet when the patient recovers goes into rehabilitation then you can do intermittent be it night or half day or whatever gastric excess should be used as standard data about post pyloric uh, is not a general advantage there are situations where it is useful but not standard and this is why we say it can be used if there is intolerance well, that's the problem of our critically ill patients. From top to bottom, everything is wrong. And it's partly due to the disease, partly due to our treatments. And actually, this makes it difficult for the nurses and for the patients. But we know that if all things are quiet, you have the same goals, there is equipoise between parenteral and enteral. These two studies, the calories, the British pragmatic one, the Nutriria, the French study, had same numbers of patients, 2,400. They were randomized to same goals, 25 kilocalories per kilo body weight, ventilated patients, septic shock patients, and parenteral or enteral. Looked at mortality at 30 days, nothing different. But there was in both studies an advantage for parental, actually. Note that this is actually full feeding from day one. So PN had less enteral complications. The gut is sensitive. You can't full feed. And you should not try either by the intravenous route. These strategies are not good. But if you do the same to the patients, the result will be the same. And this is why we had insisted on not increasing too fast with enteral. And our patients are on vasopressors. This study was published in uh, from Spain, and it aimed at assessing in 200 patients how this impacted feeding. Yes, indeed, being on vasopressors 
reduces the tolerance. If you look at the energy balance, actually it is negative all the time, but you can feed, but not full feed these patients. So it just shows that it is possible, but inefficient in terms of covering the energy. This is not bad the first days, but when time passes, you should take and watch out. This is why we designed the SPM study, Lausanne Geneva teams. What was it about? Well, we know and we have been practicing that since the years 2000, that internal nutrition should be progressed, but it does not work in all patients. So we randomized the patients on day three to be after calorimetry, either SPN, meaning completed enteral feeding with parental nutrition or continued enteral nutrition. All these patients had difficult first start. And then we looked at what happened. We did that for five days, not more. It looks like that. This is a screenshot from one of the patients. Every column is one day. The patient is clearly unsuccessful the first days, gets randomized. We measure energy expenditure down here and adapt the goal, which was too high. And then we start for three days in this case with parental nutrition, which we progressively decrease while enteral is pushed up. With that, there is no problem with glucose control. You never overfeed the patients. You see the line of eight millimole per liter is here. No problem. And with that strategy, we ended up having a significant reduction in infectious complication after day nine with less antibiotic days and everything good. And we could also just with that show that SPN is a strategy you should use in selected patients. Those where enteral is not working and you have different problems and it's not for every time. It's just a period where until the gut works. And with that, we had we have the explanation for this. We have improved immunity and reduced inflammation. And we have saved 3,300 Swiss francs per day, which is equivalent to dollars. In the patient, we did SPN with all the cost. It's a full economic study. What were we giving? In that study, we used no fancy substrates. It was just the standard, but you can manipulate that. Proteins. An ongoing story, we still don't have um, the absolute answer, but the studies which are coming out tend to tell that 1.3 gram protein per kilo per day is a reasonable goal. You may end up with that giving one to 1.1, fine uh, you should try and go to one three but progressively also you may combine it with exercise the data are not definitive yet but data have been accumulating for 10 years now showing that to go to that target not higher is reducing mortality at icu time 28 days or hospital this means that when you have a very long follow-up period, you can really show that the protein target should be covered. Energy target, if it's not guided by uh, calorimetry, you should be cautious with it. But if you do it well, as with indirect calorimetry, it's fine. And this is Christine's uh, paper. I mean, that is very interesting because it shows exactly that. 455 patients, it's a retrospective study. It shows that actually those who are doing best are those who received less than 0.8 grams during the first three days and over 0.8 grams after. Here we have this tuning of the early period again. Don't go too fast during the first days, but if you do that, the body can handle it. And regarding lipids, we, in that guidance, it can be provided. We know that the next guideline will say shall eventually should be provided. 
we know there are beneficial effects. There are no contraindications to delivering omega-3 uh, lipids to the patients. So this is my position, clearly. And, well, why so? In acute disease, you have an inflammatory response. It is well understood, clearly. Uh, and if you deliver pure omega-6 fatty acids, which are, by the way, essential to prevent essential fatty acid deficiency, you will emphasize that. Of note, you should not be feeding parenterally with omega-6 during the first days, but you do deliver propofol, which is exactly that. Huh? But if you then deliver omega-3 fatty acids, you will attenuate all that. And you will also create these SPM molecules, which contribute to the resolution of inflammation. This is a retrospective study looking at patients who've had over five days of either types of parenteral nutrition with either type of actually uh, well, fatty acids. And those who have been discharged earlier are those receiving fish oil. Clearly an improvement if you receive fish oil. In kids, omega-3s have reduced the requirements for transplantation massively in kids and adults because you don't get the so-called parental nutrition associated lip disease anymore, which was caused actually by phytosterols and the omega-6 lipids. If you give to children fish oil after having been on standard PN, you observe a reduction of bilirubin, you observe a reduction of a lot. So this is just changing it, and the reasons are obvious now. We improve bile flow, there is immunomodulation due to EPA DHA, there is reduced ketosis, and this is probably due to the combination of alpha tocopherol and actually to phytosterols being are not present in the fish oil. This is uh, what happens regarding transplantation over time. And you can observe that since the introduction in the in 2008 of these solutions, the requirement for transplantation has decreased tremendously. It also increases muscle protein fractional synthesis that has been clearly shown in volunteers. It does actually really reduce the catabolism of your patient's muscles. And this enables maintaining hand grip strength, maintaining performance. If you want to read a very good paper about it, go and look at that, this paper. It's really fantastic. And we know exactly the mechanism by which this happens. And it is actually displacing the N6 from membranes, modulating transmission, actually also working on attenuating cyclogenized enzyme. By the way, this is the way aspirin works. Attenuating inflammation, activating mTOR, etc. All this is known now. And we're just pushing people to include fish oil in their solutions. This is one more study, actually one more meta-analysis, again, an economic study, which shows you that if you include 47 randomized controlled trials, the presence of fish oil intravenous lipid emulsions reduces infection risk, reduces sepsis, ICU length of stay, hospital stay, etc. Clearly, fish oil is better in all the studies. This graph, which belongs to the same paper, just shows you how many studies were comparing the larger the blue dot, the more studies present, and comparing with the different sorts of oils. It's always MCTs up here, olive oil, soybean oil, fish oil. And all the time, you find a reduction of risk with fish oil. But that's not all. Inflammation is one thing, cytokines, but we also have the microbiome. And when we are feeding ideally enterally, we will impact our microbiome. 
and what the solution we're using matter to that. This is an amazing study. Again, I also encourage you to read this one. It's a longitudinal analysis of three different diets. It's volunteers. Um, and you have different diets, omnivore, vegan, or some of the volunteers received exclusive enteral nutrition, but fiber free. Well, then they looked at the diversity of the microbiome, etc. And then they did an action of microbiota depletion, meaning they gave antibiotics to kill everything that was in that gut. They did that for three days. And then they looked at the recovery and looked at diversity. Well, look here. This is amazing, and you should not feed any more your patient without fiber. First, you look at the number of germs present in the gut. The pure enteral nutrition without fibers is in blue. And you see that, indeed, you do reduce with the killing of bacteria with antibiotics. And then you look at how it recovers. Clearly, very slow with pure enteral without fiber. Then you look at the salmon diversity. And the omnivores are doing actually quite well, but in numbers, but not totally in the diversity. The vegans are recovering much better. They have more fibers. And uh, those on fiber-free enteral are doing poorly. And we know this matters to the outcome. So we should not deliver any enteral nutrition without fibers anymore. And not forgetting, of course, micronutrients. Well, this should be done by given to all patients. And actually, they can be provided orally if you don't have anything else. But of course, if you're parental, you go parental. And very important, we are recommending monitoring. We're recommending monitoring, but monitoring implies that you do determine C-reactive protein with every time you are determining blood levels of micronutrients. Why? Because inflammation causes a redistribution of micronutrients out of the body com blood compartment, and you have to interpret it with cautions. And we recommend, I'm just making it short because this is not a micronutrient course, that knowing that most people have not eaten for several days, at least half, you should be liberally delivering thiamine the first days. 100 to 300 milligram per day, depending on the size of your patient. 100 to 45 kilo patient, 300 to 100 kilo patient. For three to five days. And as it is well absorbed, if you don't have intervenous form, you can give it orally. Look at this. This happened during the COVID. It's pseudo-randomized trial. Actually, it's um, over 700 patients. And in 70 of them, the doctors were considering the patients were probably having a risk of refeeding syndrome and delivered thiamine, 100 milligram per day. The others received nothing. Look at the difference in mortality. It's just crazy. So. This means that refeeding is a killer and that you can do something for it. And regarding micronutrients, we have standardized the wording with the new guidelines, which is that when you have a normal status are within the blood blue here, uh, you might have a suboptimal intake from the product. Then you complete. Aim is to cover DRI. Daily recommended intakes. If you have a loss, let's say intestinal fistula, massive diarrhea, or major burns, you have an acute depletion without symptoms of deficiency. You just do repeat. You get to within normal. If you're delivering high doses, then you are into supplementation, which is a different game. And then you monitor. You monitor everything. You monitor what you deliver. Uh, this study you possibly know, it is an international study, including over 2,700 patients. Well, they looked at the prescription. Uh, the prescription was fine, 24 kilocalories per kilo of body weight, 
and 1.2 gram protein. Yes, but what happened was not so beautiful. And actually what it showed was that there is a huge difference, enteral being the main provider between what you prescribe and what the patient receives. And if you don't monitor, the patient is not receiving at all what you think it's receiving. Here was 1,000 calories instead of 1,800 and 0.6 gram of protein. It's always worse with the proteins. So be aware of that and look at it. And you should be ramping up. And during this early phase regarding micronutrients, as you are ramping up, as the solution deliver the needs of a patient only when you are roughly at 1,500 kilocalories, you have to deliver micronutrients early on just to complete the feeds because the patients are most of the time actually deficient before they come in. So this is our strategy. We go for acute phase progressively. Then when we are roughly day 45 at target, then we give 100% of indirect calorimetry. And then proteins, we go for this target that time. And when post ICU phase comes, we need to go up further and reassess whenever possible. But then the weight will become the guide of what you are delivering. So with that, the conclusion is that underfeeding and malnutrition persist in our ICUs and they generate complications. Energy needs vary across the different phases of disease. There are lower energy needs during the acute phase, not lower energy expenditure, but lower feeding needs, which is totally different. And then the individual patient varies. There is no mean patient, only individuals. And there is no equipoise between the two routes. So if we go for the same target with only full feeding, the intestine does not love, love it, disagrees even. The metabolism is overwhelmed. The progressive delivery is therefore mandatory, whatever the route, and you monitor if the patient receives what you think it's receiving. The micronutrient needs should be covered, but no big doses. That makes no sense. So with that, I hope I've made you, well, aware about some real important points of ICU nutrition. Do well. Take care. Thank you for listening. Good afternoon. Thank you, Professor Berger. Good afternoon. Uh, very lucid uh, lecture and very understandable and a complex topic and something to which uh, students are often indifferent to and, you know, nutrition being not on top of the list, uh, fluids, antibiotics, ventilation <laughs> being more popular. So uh, I request the audience to type any questions if they have. And uh, meanwhile, we can just have a brief uh, chat with uh, Professor Berger and draw on our experience. Uh, <clears throat> So, Professor Berger, uh, you mentioned that indirect calorimetry is the best way, and we understand that, but we don't have, uh, you know, means to measure indirect calorimetry. What we use is 25 kilocals per kg uh, the, as a target. So, what would you recommend where we don't have indirect calorimetry? Without indirect calorimetry, you should go during the first week, even for a bit lower, 20. And then when the patient stabilizes, you can increase to 25. We now know that it is uh, worse to go up over the needs than below. So a constant modest deficit is, easy, is well tolerated, whereas overfeeding is not tolerated during the acute phase of disease. So first week, just take it simple if you don't have indirect calorimetry and go for 20. Uh, Professor Berger, the, the, the body weight that we use, 20 or 25 kilocals per kg, that body weight is okay if you are, you know, having a normal body weight, let's say a BMI of 20 to 30. But there are patients who are obese and there are patients who are underweight also at times. So what kind of body weight do you use here? This is an... Um... A repeated problem. Most people, we have no weight and we don't have weighing scales on the beds. So 
Anyway, we should take the dry weight if we have it, non-obese. For patients with BMIs over 30 and sometimes very high, uh, you can take well, what is called the adjusted body weight or ideal body weight. I mean, as we are trying not to overfeed, uh, if you take the ideal body weight, it's a little bit too low. So this is where we go for the adjusted. Right. So, uh, Professor Berger, another question is about use of parental nutrition in surgical patients. Are there any differences in the use of parental nutrition in surgical patients or we just treat them as uh, what you have said just now in your talk? Uh, surgical patients requiring who are critically ill yeah. are in the ICU, uh, they are just as any. They tend to have a bit higher requirements, actually. But without calorimetry, you cannot distinguish that. So uh, you just go for the same rules. I have been working, originally I was working in a pure uh, surgical ICU, and it's only since 2006 that I'm also handling medical patients. And um, there are not that big differences. So uh, the uh, parental nutrition is actually more often required for transient in intestinal intolerance in the surgical uh, than in the medical, by definition, because they often have abdominal surgery. So these patients with abdominal surgery they benefit from not waiting until the end of the first week until you give them some parental. If a surgical patient has a gut which is not working, start by day three and, and stop it as soon as the gut works again. But go for those low targets, 20, to start with. Right, Professor Bugger. Progressively also. I mean, the progression rules are the same for enteral and parental. Right, Professor Berger. Another question, Professor Berger, another doubt rather. Now you know uh, the guidelines say that if the patient is in shock and you cannot, obviously in shock on vasopressors, you can't use enteral, but you can use parenteral. So is parenteral... Stop, 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 stop. <laughs> stop. It is more complex than that. Uh, in any patient who is in an unstable shock phase, you should not be feeding. Point. If a patient is unstable in resuscitation phase, you do not feed. You wait until the patient stabilizes. He can still be on vasopressors, but it is a phase, and this we insisted in the European ICU guidelines, if the requirements for fluids for vasopressor are now roughly stable, then you can consider starting. And if the gut is not the primary organ, which is a plant, you should start with so-called trickle feeding. Trickle feeding, which means 10, 20 milliliter per hour, depending on the patient's size. Of course, under shock or, well, stabilized shock, you do not go to a full feeding. So then, of course, PN is very attractive. And yes, can be used, but not during the first 24, 48 hours. You just stabilize the patient first. And then you go progressively. No full feeding. So, uh, Professor Berger, sometimes the patients don't stabilize for you know, three, four days. Then what do mm -hmm. you do with nutrition there? Do you just continue with IV fluids, normal cell line, or you know, what kind of a... Um, well, those patients who are so totally unstable for three days, they are rare. We were a tra heart transplant unit, ECMO, etc. So I can tell you that these patients are rare or they are badly treated. Hmm? Happens also. Um, if you are in an ICU where the standards are used, which is the majority of the ICUs, you should not... You can wait 48 hours, no problem. Uh, it is worse to overwhelm uh, the the organism. You, If you understood my slide uh, where we have been showing in trauma patients that they by day three were still producing 3.1 gram kilo minutes of sugar from their own muscles as neoglucogenesis, they are covering 1,200 calories of the 1,800 we were measuring. So it's not starvation. 
It is no extrinsic feeding. And th this is why we encourage to start with trickle feeding from, well, in the worst shock phase, no. But as soon as you get something balanced, to start with a 10 to 20 to use this gut, because if you don't use it, it's much more difficult to use it later on. So then you start with that. And by day four, if you're still not getting there, you complete with parental nutrition, you top up to a goal, which is calculated total 20 kilocalories per kilo body weight in absence of indirect calorimetry. Right. So uh, patients have been overfeed. Well, there are extremes. Some teams do not feed at all their patients, which is bad. And other people who are aware in absence of indirect calorimetry, have been overfeeding. So nutrition has been a killer on both sides. And we encourage a median way. La voie du milieu, we say in French, yeah, which I should understand. speak. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> other, another question is about overfeeding. You know, overfeeding, you said, it leads to increased mortality. Yes. And this is a complex area of research, I understand, and the mechanisms behind it. But if you could just simply put it, you know, uh, how, how does overfeeding actually, you said one was a fatty liver you showed us. But of course, you know, this is not a, an immediate cause of mortality. So what are the mechanisms, uh, Professor Berger, in brief, what we understand, uh, how overfeeding actually leads to increased mortality? Uh, one is hyperglycemia infections that we understand. <clears throat> yes. Well, if you increase uh, the glycemia, this is bad. You need more insulin. So this shows that your body is overwhelmed. And this actually is overwhelming the liver of your patients. Patients who are chronically overfed, they develop actually hepatomegaly from fatty liver. And this we saw by the burns were the worst experiencing this lung. But the liver dysfunction appears quite rapidly. And you have modest increases of acetylate which very clearly indicate that the liver is having sort of problem. In clinical care on day one, day two, there are so many other go good and bad reasons for having liver alteration of tests. What you can use for monitoring is their later increase, later being after two or three days of too much. You have the triglycerides, which increase also. All this is on the side of overloading. The reticuloendothelial system is not happy at all over too much. It also gets stuck. And you have the immune system stuck. You have the liver stuck. You have increasing, overloading the respiratory system with an increased CO2 production, which complicates your weaning. And if you suspect going too high, one of the things to do in a patient where you would like to wean, but it doesn't work and... PCO2 stays high, is to uh, actually reduce drastically, meaning by 30% what you have been delivering to the patient and look for two days what is happening. Well, if it doesn't change for the better, meaning reducing CO2, you reconsider that. But it is a real differential diagnosis. So clearly you affect all the systems respiratory and it is stress if you overfeed you increase your catecholamines not good so all and this means you increase also your energy expenditure because you need more energy to metabolize and do de novo lipogenesis if you have indirect calorimetry this very well shows with the respiratory quotient who goes high goes up and goes to over one, which is actually showing that the body is not using what it receives the correct way. It stores. The body starts storing. It's not able to get rid of it. And uh, it's just overloading the body. Right, I understand. Thank you. Uh, one last uh, query, Professor Berger. Uh, can you comment on GRV, the use of gastric residual volumes? Like, what is the okay. status and <laughs> Well, it depends on if you are in a medical ICU or in a surgical ICU. Having worked in a mixed ICU, I had to make sure my nurses were on board. And uh, of course, I know we know all about the papers showing that 
uh, measuring res gastric residuals only uh, reduces feeding uh, action, etc., and is additional work. Well, but my nurses told me, and I listened to them, that they preferred to have during the first three days a check of gastric residuals to avoid having a surprising vomiting episode. But when we, we use it, we don't use it for ages. We use it during the first days of feeding. So we were using it uh, every 12 hours when we initiated feeding. And then as we take away those big uh, nasogastric tubes, we go for feeding tubes you can't measure anymore. And that we do by day three. So it is measuring during the first days, especially in the surgical patients, but also in the medical and then uh, it disappears. So it is not all days, it is during the first days we have kept it with, after discussing with the nurses. Thank you, ma'am. So I think there are no questions uh, from the audience, Professor Berger, because I think it was a very lucid uh, uh, lecture, really. It was very understandable. And I think all our audience in India has uh, gained a lot from this and it will be up on our YouTube channel for the others and for the global audience of young intensivists, young students, for them to learn from this. I mean, you being a stalwart and an, a real expert in this, it was indeed an honor and pleasure. And we thank you for your time, your expertise and for the lecture. Thank you very much, Professor Bhagavad. It was a pleasure. Take care and take care of your patient. Thank you. Bye-bye.